ran across a practical tidbit I wanted to share with you this morning before I got into the message. I know a lot of you are cat people. How to wash a cat. <laughs> Put both lids of the toilet up and add one-eighth cup of pet shampoo into the water in the bowl. You pick up the cat and soothe him while you carry him towards the bathroom. In one smooth movement, put the cat in the toilet and close the lid. <laughs> the cat will self-agitate. You may need to stand on the lid and give the cat time to make ample suds. Never mind the noises that come from the toilet. The cat is actually enjoying this. <laughs> Flush the toilet three or four times. This provides a power wash and rinse. Have someone open the front door of your home. Be sure that there are no people or animals between the bathroom and the front door. Stand behind the toilet as far as you can and quickly lift the lid. The cat will rocket out of the toilet, streak through the bathroom, and run outside where he will dry himself off. Both the commode and the cat will be sparkling clean. This advice comes sincerely from the dog. <laughs> Don't you feel like that cat sometimes? You know, life just has this way of, of giving us that power wash, you know, uh, sometimes when, you know, we least expect it. And there's those difficult people or circumstances out there, and it's in those times when we find it very challenging to live out our faith. And that's what we've been talking about here over the, the last few, uh, you know, weeks and, and even months, and, and hopefully uh, that's what this church is about, is, is helping us live out our faith. And We've been talking about living in the kingdom of God according to the Sermon on the Mount, you know, according to, to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we've learned that, that living in the kingdom of God is about grace and not about rules and religious activity. And that when we get it, like when we really get the kingdom of God, that our attitudes and values and perspective changes to more reflect the values and the perspective of God. And that we embrace new qualities in our lives. New virtues begin to, to kind of rise up in our soul and kind of overflow out to others. Virtues like humility and righteousness and mercy and meekness and purity, and peace, and even sacrifice for others. We've learned that the measure of true spirituality is love and righteousness, which means right relationships. In fact, we've learned that love and right relationships fulfill the law. And we've learned that it's important for us to, to view others and treat others in the way that Jesus did. And all of this is, is awesome stuff. But there's a problem, isn't there? And that is that that dog is out there. And, and he doesn't like you. He does mean things to you. He treats you like dirt. He doesn't respect you. He postures with the boss at your expense, and he gossips about you to the neighbors. He, he, he lies to your friends and clients. He drives a better car than you. His kids are snots. He's not from here, but he's from some insane place like New Jersey. <laughs> he never remembers your birthday. Everyone thinks he's so great, but you know how phony and fake and plastic he really is. And so, yes, living in the kingdom of God would be much easier 
Living for Jesus, living a life of love and righteousness would be much easier if it were not for that dreaded dog. And yet he's everywhere in your life. He, he's your next door neighbor. He's, he's the guy that works, you know, two offices down from you. He's in your family. And so the question is, how do we live out our spirituality? How do we love God? How do we love others? How do we seek righteousness, you know, that right relationship with with God and others when the reality is, is that dog is everywhere in your life? And when our humanity rubs up against that dog, our spirituality just spirals almost every single time. It's like our kryptonite, our Achilles heel, because we just, you know, we just ball up and we get so tense and we're like, you know, what are we going to do about this person or this situation? Well, Jesus tells us how to deal with this and how to deal with those challenging people, those people that challenge your spirituality in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And let me go ahead and, and read this. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, it's funny how we react to people that, that we don't like, isn't it? You know, the people that, that we have to see, you know, all the time, maybe even every day. And it's so easy for difference to turn into disagreement and for disagreement to turn into rudeness and then for rudeness to turn into hostility, Or what about those people that just flat out do stuff to you? They lie, they cheat, they steal, they disappoint, they betray, they hurt. And we feel this need to respond. In fact, you know, we're compelled to answer, to do something because we can't allow what they did to go unanswered. And so we react, and and it's usually in a negative way somehow. Or what about those times when someone is upset with you, and you don't get it? You didn't do anything to them. You certainly did not intentionally do anything to them, yet yet there they are, and they're, they're upset, and, you know, they must have misunderstood or overreacted. Maybe they took something way too personal, and now they're cold, they're distant, or they're even angry with you. And then there are those people out there that we are just different than them. You know, we're cats and they're dogs. We don't see eye to eye. We will never see eye to eye. And we don't want to see eye to eye because we don't agree with them. And because of that, we don't particularly like them. And so towards those people, maybe we're the ones who are cool and a little smug, or, or maybe a little disagreeable. And the reality is, is that we live in a world where there are so many different people and different kinds of people that tension is inevitable. It's part of what it means to be human. Again, some of us are dogs, and some of us are cats. And Jesus truly does understand this. And so he speaks to it here in the Sermon on the Mount. And he gives us words here and the way that it's phrased to where we realize this has tremendous implications, not only in our relationship with others, but in our relationship with God. 
Look at what he's saying straight up. You cannot be fully right with God unless you're fully right with others. That could be a a theme of the overarching message of, of even what I'm saying today. He's saying true worshipers are characterized by righteousness and peace. He's saying you're responsible, you are responsible to resolve conflicts and differences. He's saying that if we are not proactive in our broken relationships and unresolved conflicts, that it can and probably will hinder your relationship with God. Finally, he's saying that true spirituality is defined by righteousness or healthy relationships. And we're saying things like, you mean to tell me that it's my problem if my mother is angry with me because I don't live up to her unrealistic expectations? Well, I'm saying that it's your responsibility to make the first move. You mean to tell me If I'm a little cool towards my neighbor, maybe a little distant towards my neighbor because his dog barks all night long every single night and neither myself nor anybody in my household can get any sleep and I've told him repeatedly and he still doesn't do anything about it, that that, that if I'm cool towards him, that it's going to damage my relationship with God? Well, quite possibly yes. You mean to tell me that I have to go around, you know, apologizing all the time just simply because I have a fiery personality and everybody else has thin skin? I'm saying that a fiery personality is not an excuse for insensitivity and rudeness. And as believers, we should understand that. And do everything within our power to ensure that those things do not happen in our relationship with others. Again, that's what Jesus is saying. Can't be fully right with God until you're fully right with others. Even obnoxious people, even disagreeable people, even hostile people like, like the dog? Yes, yes, and yes. Folks, this is the ethic that Jesus gives us. And it really is for good reason. Because if we allow all of that division, all that conflict, all that anxiety to remain in our lives, it festers and it does more damage to us than it does to other people. When all that bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and all that stuff just lies dormant, it just grows and festers and and we become something that that is less. We are the ones who suffer because of it. And so Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Forgive your brother, you know, 70 times 7. Paul said, bless those who persecute you. John said, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. You might say, well, I don't know if I can do these things. I don't, I don't even know if, if I have this in me. Well, well, three things. First of all, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, you have no choice. This is the ethic. This is the goal. This is what it's supposed to look like. We're supposed to be that person who seeks peace. We're supposed to be persons of peace. Second, this is why we have grace. Of course you can't do it. Of course it's hard. That's life. But that's why God gives us grace and he works in and through us with his spirit to give us the ability to do things that we never thought we could do otherwise. And through his grace and his strength, we can do these things. And then finally, well, that's what this passage is about. 
and this section of the Sermon on the Mount to help us and to lead us and to guide us into doing these things in the right way. So let's take a look at what Jesus says about how to go about doing these things. And and the first thing we see is, is very simple, and that is is that as Christians, as citizens of the kingdom of God, as followers of Christ, we should do everything within our power to live at peace or in peace with other people. Not a unique concept in the Bible. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. Romans 12, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 14, 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. You may be thinking, well, you know, that sounds easy enough. You know, just live and let live. Don't stir up trouble. Don't intentionally cause conflict. Try to be kind and Patience and understanding with with people and try not to to take anything personally and be too thin-skinned or to get get emotional about things. No, you know, I, I think I can do that. But we're forgetting one thing, aren't we? And that is the dog is out there. And he's difficult to live with. And just when you think you're, you're, you're doing well, the dog uh, shows up. I'll give you a for instance. We had been in our new house. We, we've been in a, a, a new house for about a year. And we've been in our new house about a month. And my daughter, who does not live with us, who lives in Atlanta, came to visit. And she came uh, with a friend, and her friend drove. And he parked in front of our house but not technically in, in front of our house. There's a space between my driveway and the neighbor's driveway just enough to fit a single car. And so that space is kind of half in front of our house and half in front of the neighbor's house, but not really in front of either house because it's kind of off to the side of both of us, but it's kind of in that, that in-between kind of space. And they were there an hour and a half on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. And they went to get back in the car and found this note on the windshield. In big, bold letters, all cap, aggressive font. If you aren't here, H-E-A-R, if you aren't here visiting me, then why are you parked in front of my house? Please park in the driveway or in front of the house you are visiting. Thank you. Now, that's a challenging neighbor. We'd lived there a month. And as far as I know, no one associated with me had ever parked in front of his house. Not a single time. And so an entire month goes by... And we're just living over there, minding our own business, having a good old time. And then one day after an entire month, someone parks on half of his property and he's got to write a note like that on a Wednesday afternoon. I mean, who's even paying attention to stuff like that? And it's a public street for crying out loud. My first reaction was to get an indelible marker and write really across it and tape it onto his front door. (laughs) My wife's reaction was a little more aggressive than mine. (laughs) She wanted to take all of our cars and park them in front of their street, (laughs) in front of his house, and then just kind of wave as we went back into our house. I knew that's not what Jesus wanted me to do. (laughs) The irony is, I was writing this very message, this very message, the week (laughs) that happened. So I'm like, okay, Lord. (laughs) You know, what, what do you want me to do about this? 
you know, how am I to live at peace with this individual? Well, for starters, you know, don't retaliate. You know, don't react, don't become reactionary, and certainly don't, don't antagonize him. You know, don't go park all of your cars in front of his house and then and wave and smile as he glares, you know, out the window at you. I decided that the right thing to do to serve my neighbor and in the effort of peace was that as far as it depends on me, that, that, that you know, I'm not going to park in front of his house and do my very best to try and honor his request with myself and my guests. I resolved to be even friendlier with this neighbor and to try and become friends with this, with this neighbor, which, which, which I have done. I resolve to pray for my neighbor, which, which I have done. I have resolved to try and express the attitudes and virtues of the kingdom in my life towards this individual. That as much as I can uh, to be humble and gracious and merciful and, and, and again, be a peacemaker. And then, above all things, that at some point, that when, when I have the opportunity that I need to share the good news with this person because he seems like someone who could certainly use some good news. And the bottom line is, is that living in a neighborhood with other people, random people who you don't, don't get to choose, requires tolerance and grace. Working with people every single day, the same people interacting with them, going to school with the same people every single day requires tolerance and grace. Being in the same family with some people, and we all (laughs) laugh at that one because we all have that person or people, requires tolerance and grace. Folks, the world doesn't always get this, but we do, right? Because we're citizens of the kingdom. And as citizens of the kingdom, we are people of peace. And so we do everything within our power to be at peace with other people. But there's there's more to this, isn't there? There's a question that we all have, it's in the back of our minds, and we're like, okay, well, what happens if in spite of everything that we do to maintain a peaceful relationship with someone and to be nice to someone, that conflict still arises? What do do we do then? Well, look at the text. It says, if your brother has something against you, the implication here is you're not the one taking offense. You're not the one even driving the conflict. But in spite of that, we know that issues will still arise. And when they do, as kingdom citizens, as peacemakers, those who seek peace, we are to do everything within our power to seek peace and reconciliation in that relationship. Again, the Sermon on the Mount is commentary on the Beatitudes. This is what Christ meant when he said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who desperately long for right relationships, when the relationships are broken, they're going to try and fix them. Do everything within their power to fix them. 2 Corinthians 5.18 teaches us that Christ gives us the ministry of reconciliation. Colossians 3.13, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Folks, conflict is inevitable when human beings are involved. It will happen. We can't help it. The question is, how do we respond when conflict does arise? Well, we've probably all seen how not to respond. The church where 
I found Christ and, and was baptized. Has a reputation for being a notoriously difficult church. I'll give you a, a for instance, and I could give several. This is, this is probably the worst of them, but uh, a few years back, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the church was incredibly divided about the music in the church. And one side, we'll call group A, was convinced that God wanted them to have traditional music with an organ and a piano and hymnals and, and the whole deal. And group B was convinced that God wanted them to have more contemporary music, probably what we would even consider blended, but they wanted to kind of open the door and to bring in some other instruments and some other songs and some other things uh, going on. And the situation became very tense and very difficult, to say the least. And so... Group A decides that they're going to hold a secret business meeting where they're going to vote out of membership all of the people in Group B. Well, the people from Group B hear about the secret business meeting and they show up. And the subsequent business meeting becomes extremely heated. And the discussion becomes very, very hostile. And so a number of the people from group B decided that we're not going to stand for this anymore, that they've had enough, and they got up and walked out of the building and left the building. But some of the people from group A couldn't let it go, and they followed them out into the parking lot where they proceeded to have an argument. And the argument escalated into an actual physical altercation. And everyone runs out of the church to see what's going on. And before we know, pretty much all of the males involved are in a physical melee in the parking lot. The riot squad had to be called in. Which consisted of 12 police cars, police cruisers coming and breaking everybody up. And after they got everybody calmed down and everything broke up, group B went home and group A went back into the church and proceeded to vote out of membership everyone that was in group B. This happened nearly 10 years ago. And as far as I know, no one from group A still feels like they have ever done anything wrong. How that must break the heart of God. Instead of fighting, they should have been praying. They should have been seeking God. They should have been loving one another. They should have been serving one another. They should have been preferring one another. What would have happened in that situation had those folks practice this principle that we're looking at today? What would have happened that when instead of insisting on their own way, they went into that meeting humbly, asking themselves, how can I personally help our church seek reconciliation and resolution and unity? And instead of looking at at what was wrong with everybody else, maybe asking the question, where am I at fault in this situation? Where where do I need forgiveness? And and where do I, you know, need to forgive others? Is this not the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount? Is this not the spirit of the Beatitudes? Is, Is this not... What is being described here as to how a kingdom citizen is supposed to conduct himself or herself and how to live? Because the kingdom is about righteousness. The whole point is right relationships with God and with others. That's our agenda. 
The music is irrelevant. In the grand scheme of things, it means almost nothing. But the unity of your body and the relationship that you have with your brothers and sisters is everything. And so we do, as kingdom citizens, everything we can do ourselves to seek peace and reconciliation. But there's an additional question here, isn't there? There's an additional issue. And that is that we can do everything we can to live at peace with other people, in good faith, sincerely so. And we can do everything within our power to seek peace and reconciliation and be as genuine as as we possibly can and make our best efforts as flawed as we are. And there will still be times, there will still be situations when conflict will still exist. Where there is, from our view, nothing else we can do to seek resolution because someone else is still upset with us. For example, Jesus could not resolve his ultimate conflict with the Pharisees. And it cost him his life. Now, this passage here doesn't tell us how to deal with that. But he tells us just a few verses later, starting in verse 38. And Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Straight up, our flesh does not like this. Because we intuitively understand the implications. This opens us up to be taken advantage of by others who do not necessarily share our values or have our ethic in how to approach relationships and conflict resolution. You think Jesus was being naive? You think he just missed something? No. He's telling us probably the hardest part about living in the kingdom of God and trying to live in the kingdom of this world at the same time. And he's trying to help us. Because sometimes there will be differences that we can't reconcile. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. He said, you know, blessed are you when people persecute you and revile you and say all sorts of things against you. He knew that this was coming, and he's telling us how to deal with it. In our American John Wayne, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality, we don't like it because we think it makes us weak. But if we do this and we live it out in the spirit in which it's intended, it makes us spiritual. It makes us like Christ. We have a a situation in our family, actually it's, it's on my wife's side of the family, where we have an individual who is intentionally estranged from the rest of the family. She has pulled away and has chosen to have nothing to do with the family. And it's actually a very sad, very bizarre, very hurtful situation because we think that she's mentally ill. She shows all the classic signs of being severely bipolar, but she refuses to consider that possibility. And so one day she's 
happy and, and our relationship is positive and healthy and good and, and everything's great with this family member. She attends all the family things and laughs and cuts up and does everything, you know, just, you know, just like all of the rest of us. And then it's like one day a switch went off. And it's never f- switched back up. And she's convinced that nobody loves her, everybody hates her, and everyone is out to get her. And that no one in the family has ever done or expressed a kind word or loving deed towards her her entire life. And myself and others who are close to the family or maybe distant relations who have seen the family firsthand find all of this completely preposterous because we've, we've watched her grow up. We've watched her interact with her family. We've watched how wonderful her family is and how much they love her and how they have just showered her with love and kindness and compassion their entire lives. She is fortunate to have the family that she does. And yet no one can talk with her. Certainly not about this. There is this intense venom and malevolence when anyone tries to interact with her. You know, she's paranoid and and delusional. She's, She's actually taken the time to write these terrible letters to every one of her surviving immediate family members that are pages long of one slight or grievance or event that she's turned in a negative way, you know, one after the other, telling people all of the terrible things they've done, what terrible people they are, and how she never wants to have anything to do with them ever again, including her mother she has sent this to. And the family receives these letters and we're like, we don't know what to do with that. And and seeing it from a close perspective, the the family has been, been so gracious and so understanding and so patient. In fact, her sister took the letter she had received and answered every single one of those slights. And in a case where there possibly could have been anything, she heartfeltly apologized and asked for forgiveness. In the others, she she tried to explain, and then the best part of the letter is she went on just as long as her sister did, recounting memory after fond memory after wonderful memory of all of the rich, loving times they shared together, and said, this is our heritage. You're my sister. Can't we at least try to reestablish the relationship? And the estranged sister actually took that letter and picked it apart line by line and found a way to twist every positive memory into a negative one. And she will go and she will, she will tell people that she grew up with all of these terrible things about the family and, and people will, will, will correct her. And they'll say, now, I was there. That's not what happened. That is not what was said, and that's certainly not what was intended. And the minute they do that, that person is now the villain and and is accused of siding with her evil family, and now that person is cut off. A few years back, she was going through a hard time financially, and the family found out about it in a roundabout way, indirectly from people who knew people who knew people. And she was losing her house. And the family reached out to her, thought maybe this is is the chance, you know, to mend those fences. 
and offer her a place to stay and to try and get her back on her feet. And, and some, some people even knew some, some job connections where she could get a job and maybe she could, she could save her house. And she lashed back with as much intensity as ever and accused the family of trying to manipulate her. What else do you do? Guys, this is life. You know, it's easy to sit up here and, and talk about righteousness and right relationships and, you know, all rainbows and puppies and, and, and on all of that. But this is what a lot of us have to live with, isn't it? This is the kind of stuff that, that, that we deal with. And frankly, as far as our spirituality is concerned, this is where the rubber meets the road. So what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what the family's done. The first thing they do is they do not take the bait. Never once has the family reacted or responded in a negative way or said anything negative to her. Not a single time. In fact, the family has gone out of their way to be gracious and compassionate and loving and reach out time and time again. The family has, has prayed for her repeatedly, and praying that she'll get better. The family holds no grudges. There's, there's forgiveness there. It's already given. And I would say finally that it has been communicated to her on numerous occasions that the door is always open if she ever wants to come back and be a part of the family, that we love her and we want her to be in our lives. And if she ever desires to take that opportunity, that we will receive her with open arms. In other words, we respond to that last question. What do you do when when you can't resolve the conflict. And as far as it depends on you, you've done everything in your power. You've gone to that person, you've talked with them, and, or, or whatever you needed to do to, to make it right, and you've done those things, and you've taken those steps, and that person still feels the same way, and that tension, that conflict is still there. You know, what, what do you do? And Jesus said it really well. You continue to love that person. What do you say? Love your enemies. You continue to love them and treat them well and live out the Beatitudes and you treat them as you would anybody else because you are a kingdom citizen and you don't discriminate about, you know, who you're going to show love to and, and who you don't. You maintain your spiritual integrity and you leave the rest of the Lord. Jesus lived this out, again, with the Pharisees. There were a lot of people kind of, kind of, I guess, out to get him. I guess maybe is the best way to say it. People that disagreed, people that tried to trip him up, and people that tried to do him physical harm. And remember what he did when he was hanging on that cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if you want to be like Jesus, and I know that's a high standard, we need to seek this ethic in our lives. And there's something right about it, something whole, something pure, something good. And I guarantee you that if, if there's conflict in your life, or as you go through your life and there's those difficult people and you live out these principles, living at peace, do everything you can to be at peace with others. When there's conflict, you do everything you can to initiate resolution and reconciliation and peace. And even when conflict is not possible, 
You continue to love that person and seek righteousness in that person's life. You seek that right relationship as much as you can. And the conflict may or may not be resolved. But in your heart, in your life, as you look yourself in the mirror, as you lay your head down on the pillow, you will know that you have done everything you can. And there will be a clear conscience and a spirituality and a Christ-likeness that I guarantee will bring transformation to your life and relationships one way or another. I know this isn't easy. However, I believe that more Christians are impeded in their relationship with God in this area than in any other area. Wrong relationships, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, maybe even outright hostility will eat you up. And it will stifle and stagnate your relationship with God. Because you can't open your heart to his love and his forgiveness when it's full of all that garbage and all that bitterness and all that resentment. And so I challenge you this morning to resolve in your life and in your heart to emulate our Savior, to emulate Jesus and walk in the kingdom as he has shown us and as he's instructed us. And trust him with this, because I guarantee you this will require faith. It will require the, just the overcoming of your flesh. I mean, it's not, again, intuitively speaking, we understand the implications of this and we don't like it. But this may be the very breakthrough that you need in your life to begin experiencing the peace and the love and the grace and the joy that you've been longing for in your life with the Lord because these are the things that stop it all up.